come back uh, to that uh, as, uh, as we go along. Um, and uh, so there's many, many reasons to study. And I think in some sense, Chen Simon's theory is really some kind of universal framework that, uh, um, uh, yeah, that really uh, provides impact on, on all these different fields. So of course, traditionally, people do Chen Simon's theory with a standard gauge group that is in some unitary group, SU2. or um, uh, But um, then maybe even some non-compact ones. But uh, so um, what I will talk about is here uh, about gauge supergroups. And I think this is uh, actually quite impressive that Ribert really pioneered this field. Back in 92 with Lev Rosansky, long before anybody, I think, talked about this. And it took, I think, even now it's kind of coming back into fashion. People understand that this was an important problem to be addressed and that there's a lot in supergroup John Simon's theory to be discovered. Uh, but Hubert kind of uh, predated that uh, several decades. So this was tr truly visionary, and I'm really impressed. Uh, with that. I should also say th th another reason why I choose this topic is I, I think um, when I came to Seclay and met Hubert, I was trying to make everything unitary. And some, some of whom Hubert, I learned that this is kind of throwing the fun out of life. And uh, so if there's nothing indecomposable, um, as there's always when you have super algebras, then, uh, then there's just no fun. And so I think I, I really owe this to you, this uh, remarkable discovery that I started to love. Uh, in decomposables, maybe not quite to the extent uh, you do, but uh, but still uh, it is. Uh... Okay, so I will um, I will actually approach the subject of uh, of supergroup Chen Simon's theory. Um, so my my plan is basically basically to construct the observables of these theories uh, and the states state space, right? So that's really in, in the quantum theory. And um, so I'll be using a, a quantization framework that uh, I developed also decades ago, together with uh, Anton Alexeyev and initially also Harald Grosse, uh, back in the mid-90s, so after Hubert had already started to think about supergroup John Simon's theory. And that goes under the name of combinatorial quantization. And the beautiful thing about this combinatorial quantization, you should think of it as somehow um, you discretize, I mean, John Simons is a, is a topological theory, so you should be able to put it on the lattice and, um, and then uh, treat it on the lattice as an exact theory. And what we uh, put forward or suggested is that if you make sort of make a lattice gauge theory, but you don't make the lattice connections to be taking values in the group, but in a quantum group, uh, then you could actually recover the, uh, the observables, I mean, the gauge invariant objects in this lattice gauge theory, quantum group lattice gauge theory, would be the John Simons observables. Okay, and so we uh, we developed this and then showed also that this is uh, this is what happens that we recovered sort of really the ordinary observables of uh, of John Simons theory. So so the John Simons theory, of course, there's a for the observable quantities, there's a, a notion of what it means to quantize, right? This is really introducing h bar, and somehow this got to this work related to this quantum deformation in the in the holonomies. Okay, so um, so this uh, this combinatorial quantization of John Simon's theory, in fact, uh, also kind of in the last few years has uh, gained new popularity. In fact, it's sort of uh, um, as we will see, also um, it's a, it's a, a, the key example for for uh, uh, Lurie's framework of factorization homology. So mathematicians now have really rediscovered uh, rediscovered that. And what that kind of means is that this is uh, something that you will see is somehow locally this uh, lattice gauge theory is really boring. It, uh, so you have just one particular set of degrees of freedom, namely the things that sit, sit on the lattice that do not know anything about the surface, of course. But just by putting these things together into an interesting algebra, you put the surface geometry into the problem. And that, that's where all the sort of meat sits. So I'll try to stress that as we, as we proceed. So my plan is uh, to roughly to review this combinatorial quantization for you. That's uh, 2 thirds of my talk. And um, so there's uh, some twists. Um, Compared to the, so initially when we developed that that was all really for for unitary groups but of course now we want to apply it to supergroups and so we want to keep all this uh, non semi simple structure and so one has to do it for for gauge symmetries which have uh, a non semi simple representation theory and it turns out that this is actually not so difficult to adjust and somehow these people the mathematicians working in factorization homology had more or less 
already rethought the approach in a way that makes it kind of more or less straightforward. So I will, I'll describe this combinatorial quantization for you in a way that it kind of more or less immediately applies then to the non-semi-simple case. And then in the second part, I will go back to the example that Hubert studied many years ago with Rosansky, namely the U11 or GL11 John uh, Simons theory and try to, uh, to, to see what it looks like in that, in that framework. OK, so um, the combinatorial quantization, as I said, you need just two ingredients in this story. So imagine you, you put some lattice. You have to put something, some algebra, on the, on the links of this lattice. And initially, you can think of this lattice not having any multi-links, just, uh, just single links between vertices, no loops. And um, so what we need is, uh, is uh, as an input, is a quasi-triangular factorizable ribbon Hopf algebra, super Hopf algebra. So I won't go through the precise definition here, but pro I think everybody here knows what a Hopf algebra is, and super probably also graded Hopf algebra. And then there's just a few extra words. That means there's an R matrix. So you have some kind of braid group. Uh, factorizable is a kind of a technical condition. And ribbon is that there is some special central element in the algebra which factorizes somehow this uh, R prime R monodromy. Okay, so the details are not so important. It just means that there's a little bit of additional structure to just having, having a graded Hopf algebra. And we also need a right integral, as we will see later, which is just the map from G to complex numbers. So that's going to be our gauge symmetry okay, of, of this thing, like in the, on the lattice gauge theory. And now we're going to define like one extra piece of algebra. That's, um, that's uh, the lattice holonomies. You think of these as being assigned really to a, to a link in your lattice gauge theory. And uh, so normally you would assign a group-like element. And now we assign an element which satisfies more or less RTT relations. So these are not RTT. You see there's a little prime here, which means permutation. Uh, so it's similar to how you would normally define a quantum group. I assume that most of you know how to do that or have seen RTT relations. Just with this prime, I call this uh, then. So it defines some kind of non-commutative algebra. And I'll show you, if you've never seen this before, you'll see an example later on. What, so it's definition of some non-commutative algebra, yet which you can think of as a non-commutative deformation of the algebra functions on the group. Okay. And so uh, it turns out that this uh, algebra admits uh, gauge symmetry. So you have a left and right action uh, of the gauge symmetry through these formulas. Okay, and this is something like left and right invariant vector fields on this algebra. So it's a, it's a nicely symmetric algebra that you can introduce. Okay, and it's uh, something that, that you can, can study. Um, uh, but the real fun starts now when you take this, this simple algebra, it's just one algebra that we introduce, namely this, uh, this uh, so-called link algebra. And now we try to put it together with the geometry of some surface. Okay, and that's where really this, uh, the, the, uh, the fun starts. So what you do is you take your surface, two-dimensional surface, you put like a, a graph on it, let's say, and initially without any uh, loops and multi-links. And um, so for each, uh, each uh, edge on your, on your uh, graph or lattice, you introduce one of these algebras. Um, these link algebras, but of course, I think as all of Uber's friends also know is, if you have something that transforms under some uh, quasi-triangular Hopf algebra, uh, two objects, you cannot make them commu commute and have that consistent with the action of, the, of this Hopf algebra. So you have to make them braided commute. So when you put these algebras together on various links, so if the links actually meet, have one, at least one point in common, then you have to make sure that the commutation relation involves some kind of braid matrix. Otherwise, it would be inconsistent with the symmetry. You would break the symmetry. Okay? So that's what's written here, basically. When you have two links here, and they happen to meet, like in one, have one vertex in common, uh, then when you want to commute elements from these two algebras, you have to do this with some kind of R matrix. If the two links are far apart from each other, don't have any ends in common, there's no problem making them commute. That's consistent with the symmetry. Okay? So in order to make this all uh, work, you have to introduce a little bit of extra structure on your graph. You, uh, I think these are details that I don't want to talk about um, uh, because in the end it doesn't uh, really matter so much. So when you, when you put these, uh, these algebras, so in each link you have now defined one algebra. Now you've put them together according to the geometry or topology of some, some graph. You get a large non-commutative algebra. 
And so these definitions make sure that this uh, algebra enjoys still a lot of gauge symmetry. So it, the gauge transformation at each vertex are a symmetry of this algebra. That's sort of the construction principle of this algebra. So you get a large non-commutative algebra that has a, has a large gauge symmetry, basically, which has a copy of your Hopf algebra uh, at, each, at each vertex. Okay, so that's usually like a, a, a huge amount of gauge symmetry. And uh, the, uh, the interesting objects, of course, is the subalgebra of gauge invariant objects, the thing that, that uh, transform trivially um, with the co-unit under this gauge symmetry. And that's, again, it's, an, it's a non-commutative algebra, complicated. We'll see it. It's actually lots of interesting examples of algebras that you can build in this way. Um, and, uh, and this algebra, in fact, does not depend on many of the structures that I had introduced in the meantime. So it's, uh, it's a fairly universal, just really depends on the, uh, on, the, on the graph we started with, not with extra data. And that is our, our claim back then, was that this is really the algebra of observables of chern simons theory. This is some non-commutative algebra, which uh, should have representations on conformal blocks, things of this type. And in fact, that, uh, that is true. So um, maybe as a, as a Common side comment is, I mean, initially these relations uh, spell out the definition of the algebra for, for graphs without multiple links and loops, but you can think of even the graphs with links and loops as sub-algebras of this algebra, so it's, uh, it's included. This is a technical. Yes? Uh, how the matrix is normalized? How what? Normalized? No, but I mean, I, I mean, I chose, I didn't maybe specify all the, uh, uh, but I mean, I, it's a quasi-triangular, so I have this, uh, yes, well, but not only, uh, so I, yeah, I've, I've, sorry, I've been a little cavalier about the precise definition here, um, so it's a, yeah, it said, I mean, so it's not just the solution of, of Young-Baxter, but it has this uh, usual property that delta, acting on one of the legs of R is delta 1, 3 times delta 1, 2. So, so there's non homo Right. Yeah. All right. Good. So, um, so now it turns actually out that in the construction of this, uh, of this algebra of observables, uh, there's lots of invariances. You can actually change the number of of links on your lattice and the number of, of vertices on your lattice. The only thing that you can't really change is the number of, of faces. So we can uh, actually, in constructing this algebra of observables, we can choose uh, what we call the standard graph. So now let's, let's suppose we have a surface here of genus G. So there's G handles here. Maybe we have some extra number of punctures. Number of punctures are enumerated from 1 to n minus 1. So I'll talk about why I call this n minus 1. The surface actually I imagine to be an open surface with a, with a boundary, is, which is a circle. And that's some, this one twist of the story that uh, we didn't have 20 years ago, but that people in factorization homology added to the story. And it's actually uh, quite, uh, as we'll see in a moment, it's actually quite an quite important shift. Um, and so then we put a graph on this, on this surface where we have, of course, uh, uh, we now we allow loops, so we have loops uh, encircling the A and B cycles of the handles, and then loops going around the punctures. And so I told you before that when we have a link that satisfies this RTT relation, you can then compute by splitting a link, uh, a loop into three links, you can compute the commutation relation for this algebra that is associated to the loop. It looks like this, maybe also familiar for some of you. It's it, another non-commutative algebra. In fact, it turns out that this algebra is isomorphic to the Hopf algebra you start with as, a, as an algebra. Um, raises his brows. It's actually maybe also not so surprising because some of you imagine that uh, uh, a little loop uh, has less symmetries, of course, has just symmetries under adjoint action, not under left and right action. So it kind of looks like um, it fits at least. Anyway, you can check that this is true. And then you can compute, of course, all the commutation relations between all these various cycles, A and B cycles, on this uh, on the surface. So, in fact, I should say for the for the handle for each handle, you get sort of a pair of uh, of these loop algebras. Each loop algebra is isomorphic to G itself, but um, when you put them together, you get something that is a double. So it's uh, it's actually isomorphic to the Heisenberg double. So, so this is. Um, 
these are the basic elements. So you have here this Handel algebra, which is sort of the Heisenberg double defined through uh, relations like this, and you have these uh, loop algebras. And now came something. So, so again, so when you take this algebra and compute the, the so in, on this graph, I should say you have only you have two uh, g plus n minus one of these links or loops, and you have only a single vertex. Okay, so the gauge symmetry is just action in the single vertex. And uh, so when you take a gauge invariance with respect to the gauge transformation at this vertex, you can get this algebra of observables of Chern Simons. Again, this funny, interesting, non commutative algebra of which we want to do representation theory. And so to do representation theory, we invented something that uh, I guess is, uh, is an anionic or I mean, anionic version of Jordan Wigner transform that we saw so much about this morning. This is actually for non-abelian anions in some sense. So you see these, uh, all these link loop algebras here, right? This sort of these algebras that sit here, they are intertwined. So they, they don't commute with each other, but they have this braided commutation uh, property, right? And that, of course, prevents you from writing down representations of this algebra right away. Um, but it turned out if you take this algebra here, this is the UGN minus 1. This is this algebra generated by all these, uh, these loops and with braided commutation. You take the semi-direct product with the action of the gauge symmetry, then this thing actually is isomorphic to the just ordinary tensor product of the Handel algebras and these uh, these uh, loop algebras, this G. So you have, uh, of course, a tensor product of G uh, Handel algebras and a tensor product of n minus one uh, loop algebras. So this is now the ordinary tensor product, or in the graded case, the graded tensor product. Okay, a semi-direct product with G. And so I call this a, a anionic jordan wigner transformation because you see here everything is braided. So all the elements have some braided commutation relation, whereas here everything just commutes. So this is kind of the bosonic or at most fermionic type, right? And then indeed, when you look at how you prove this, it's like a jordan wigner transform. You have to give objects like long tails through half of the lattice. Uh, so you see this is a little bit like a, a lattice. There's a bunch of Handel algebras, and then there's a a bunch of loop algebras, and you kind of really decouple them by attaching long tails of, uh, of braiding uh, to these things. And that allows you to do this, uh, this uh, funny uh, computation. OK, so that, of course, now tells us immediately how we, how we can represent this, right? Because this, of course, we just have to know how to represent uh, the individual pieces in here. And then we get representations of this algebra. And uh, from there, we will, I'll show in a moment how you get an also representations of the observable algebra. So the first thing is that this Handel algebra U10, uh, which is one of these building blocks in this, uh, uh, after the, we factorized everything, made everything commuting, um, this actually admits a representation on, on the space, which is just G. And again, that's not so surprising. It ended, started to be sort of a double of G, right? When you when you construct states, you expect to get functions on half of the number of variables. So it actually uh, looks likely that the half is again G. So you can represent this algebra on, uh, on G itself, on your Hopf algebra itself. So this is sort of the coordinates. Uh, and uh, in fact, there's it's a nice Fox space representation of this, of this algebra that you can build. And that's kind of a unique representation of this Handel algebra. It has only this one representation on this, uh, on this space. Of course, for, for the other ingredients uh, here, uh, g n minus 1, we know how to build representations. That's our Hopf algebra. And we just pick whatever representations we like of our Hopf algebra. And so we get representations now of this semi-direct product of the lattice algebra for the standard graph times uh, semi-direct product with g um, on a space, which is uh, g copies of the representation space of the Handel algebra plus whatever tensor product or tensor with any product of representations of G that we might, might want to look at. Okay, So this could be, I don't know, for UQSL2, some two-dimensional representations of UQSL2, something like that. Now, um, so this is representation of this algebra, the algebra of observables of, uh, of John Simon's theory, of course, were just the invariant objects. So these are objects which commute with the action of the gauge symmetry. So we have now represented this semi-direct product here on this space. And of course, under the action of G, there's some action of G on this space, it will decompose uh, in some way, and there will be multiplicity spaces. And our algebra of observables of Chern Simons will act basically in the multiplicity spaces of the tensor product decomposition of the G action. Okay? So, um, and, uh, and so now we pick 
we pick like any representation that we like uh, that appears in this tensor product. We compute the multiplicity space, which is this object here. And that will carry then a representation of our algebra of observables. Okay? So, um, so in the end, of course, we have here n labels. But some of the first n minus 1 labels here appear really by picking representations of G. Uh, the last one also is a representation of G, but this is really a multiplicity space uh, and not, uh, not the same as just tensoring uh, with this thing. And that's, of course, a very important um, uh, distinction, not for the compact case, but of course, when you go to, to supergroups. So, um, OK, how am I doing with time? Not so good. So I think, I, as I said, I wanted to. So I mean, maybe one, one comment here at this point. Uh, you can maybe at least see a little bit that this is a uh, John Simon's theory has a deep connection with representation theory because, uh, uh, again, it gives naturally the algebra of observables gives naturally sort of something that commutes with the action of G and tensor products of representations. So it naturally gives structures of algebras that really describe the commutant when you take tensor products of representation of quantum deformed or in the degenerate limit of undeformed uh, algebras. And so, not so surprisingly, when you analyze examples of these algebras that you find of observables, they identify with things that, um, that appear in, in uh, for instance, uh, double alpha and Hecke algebras. I mean, these kind of structures that we know control sort of decomposition of tensor products um, in a way. So th this is just to say, first of all, there's an interesting link to representation theory integrable models. And also, these are really it's, it's an incredible source for interesting algebras, in fact. So, um, um, Well, I could give you sort of a set of generators and relations and, and things of this type. So uh, it now depends, of course, also what uh, examples you're interested in. Each one for each choice of n and g. And yeah, yeah, they are all different. I mean, categorical equivalents. That's, of course, like more. I don't know. Um, I mean, OK, there's probably a deeper layer to, to answer your question. But I mean, if you think of them as being generated. I mean, for instance, I mean, I can give you just, I mean, for, yeah, maybe, maybe not. And to save time, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to, to talk more about this, because this is sort of the angle that I like particularly about this uh, uh, problem right now. So uh, there's one, one little piece in the general story that I want to talk about that's um, now kind of going towards uh, application, in particular, co computing topological invariance. Um, there's now, from here, a very easy route to compute uh, um, mapping class group representations and thereby three manifold invariants. In fact, you can write down a universal formula. So the mapping class group of the surface with n punctures and, uh, and uh, genus G is generated by Dane twists, which are associated to simple loops on your surface. And now, of course, if you're in the lattice gauge theory, you have like a, a loop on your surface, you can just take a product of, uh, uh, of monodromies uh, following that, that loop, right? So to each, uh, each loop of your surface, you have a canonical element, m of p, which is just a product of these, these uh, monodromies that I introduced before. And uh, so that's uh, this object. And then with Asad, we found uh, this beautiful formula, which you tensor this with inverse of ribbon element and evaluate the right integral. Then you get an element in this algebra of observables, and that's canonically associated to the simple uh, curve on your, um, on your surface. And in fact, um, uh, thereby also to a Dane twist. And it turns out that this map from, uh, from the Dane twist generator to this particular element, element in the algebra of observables really gives the projective representation of the mapping class group. And that's, again, sort of a universal, universal formula. It's, it's quite beautiful uh, in its elegance. Now, if you evaluate this for, uh, for a semi-simple case, of course, you just go back to the representations worked out by Richard Tiki and Turayev a long, long time ago on these multiplicity spaces. And uh, in other examples, you get sort of non-semi-simple extensions of this, uh, of this formula. And of course, once you have this representation of mapping class group, you can go on and construct representations of, uh, I mean, three manifold invariants and through three, three manifold invariants, also loop and link invariants, and so on and so forth. So uh, that brings me to the um, to the end of the first part. So I kind of just reviewed sort of this framework of combinatorial quantization. I've showed you that I mean, 
it's a, it's a quite remarkable framework where you start with a very simple basing block that doesn't know anything about surfaces. Then you kind of put it together using the geometry of a surface and you get like a huge host of new interesting algebras with interesting representation theory that in particular allows you to compute three manifold invariants and, uh, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So now I will in the second part show you a very concrete example of this and this of course uh, is uh, the beautiful example of GL11 which is um, of course the, the example that also Hubert worked out with Lev uh, Rosansky in uh, 92 so almost 30 years ago and um, so uh, let's see what this all looks like. And for those of you who have been found the previous relations all a little bit abstract, I mean, I think this uh, made it maybe a little bit more concrete. So the first thing is, I told you there's just two building blocks, two things that you need to know, then you can go away. This is sort of your pieces of your Lego. So first of all, the UQGL11 is given here. So you have two generators, bosonic generators, two fermionic generators with this set of relations, okay? So they look pretty innocent, uh, uh, um, nothing too much to say. So one of these K alpha is, is actually central, um, commutes with everything else. And then, uh, so this is a Q deformation of GL11, ordinary Lie algebra. Uh, the second important element that one needs is this, uh, this link algebra. I told you it's some deformation of the algebra of functions on the group. And here it is. So you have uh, two commuting coordinates, uh, um, bosonic coordinates and then fermionic coordinates and they have this uh, interesting set of relations. So that's all you need. And from these two algebras basically you can paste together your entire uh, uh, system now. Now let me also give you just flash formula. So this is the R matrix uh, ribbon element and the right integral. Uh, so they are all explicitly known in this case. I mean these are all the ingredients we need. So we have, uh, have these pieces. Now what I have to teach you in addition uh, is a tiny little bit of representation theory of uh, quantum deformed GL11. Now GL11 is an algebra that has here basically it's an abelian bosonic subalgebra which has only one dimensional representations. On top of that you have some fermionic uh, operators which of course can only, so you have one raising and one lowering operator. So a typical representation in the, in the mathematical way of the word is a two dimensional representation with two quantum numbers characterizing the, the one-dimensional representation of the bosonic uh, subalgebra. Um, so I call these representation pi e n. e and n are these two quantum numbers. Um, so these are typical two-dimensional representations. And then, of course, we know that when uh, e is equal to zero, then these things become indecomposable, and you have one-dimensional atypical representations pi n. All this, of course, was known a long time. It already appears in uh, Hubert's work in, uh, um, <coughs> with Rosansky. And of course, you have then what makes, starts to make things interesting. You have these projective representations, projective covers of these atypical ones. So you have indecomposable representations which contain, so there's a plus, no, sorry, that's right. So which contain uh, four one dimensional representations. So these are four dimensional representations where you have like a top, and then you can go with the fermions, can go down two layers until you reach the bottom. Okay, so these are uh, the representations we will need. And so now, from now on, basically, we just follow our, uh, our recipes. So uh, first of all, I told you what we have to understand in order to make representation theory, we have to get uh, hand on this, uh, the Handel algebra and the representation of the Handel algebra, right? So when we take these two, these two monodromies that are kind of intertwined, like one is the A cycle, B cycle of the torus that has a representation um, on the space which is isomorphic as a linear space, isomorphic to the, uh, to the Hopf algebra G itself, and it carries the adjoint action of G. And you can now go ahead and compute how this space decomposes with respect to the adjoint action of G, and you'll find this decomposition. So there's a lot of uh, projectives, but there's also four uh, a typical one-dimensional irreducible representations. Okay. So, um, so once you have that, um, you then have to choose a, maybe a bunch of representations of G itself. You take the tensor product and you get uh, this representation spaces of the uh, of the semi-direct product that we had before. And now we understood that the representations of the observable algebra you get in the multiplicity spaces of the action of G on this thing. So this you can compute. Uh, 
And so you'll find, for instance, that uh, when you are in a genus G surface with zero punctures, and you look for the multiplicity spaces of the, atyp of the atypical pi zero, you get a representation space of, of this particular dimension. So there is a contribution here from, from all these, uh, these guys here. Um, and then there is uh, some contributions that come for the, from these atypical pieces. You can, of course, also put in some punctures um, and, um, and then add this formula and compute in all these cases dimension of the representation space. So the first conclusion here is actually, so this way you can realize, in, as, again, this multiplicity space is the representation of John Simon's observables in any genus. If you do it for genus zero, then you get uh, this dimension, and that agrees basically with the space of conformal blocks in the Vesomino model on the sphere that we studied with Hubert uh, many years ago. Now, uh, now you can go in that sort of the final, final part. I guess I'm pretty much right on time, right? Or, yeah. Uh, you can go ahead and also compute the mapping class group representations from here. And that, of course, brings us closer to uh, the formulas of, of Rosansky and Saleur uh, back in 92. So uh, you can just use, I mean, this is sort of the formula spelled out that I gave you before. I mean, it's funny, right integral acting on v minus 1 and so on and so forth. In this case, it takes this particular form. So for this formula, you can compute all the generators of the mapping class group. In particular, you can compute when you're on the torus, you can compute the uh, uh, action of the, um, the generators S and T of the torus modular group, the products of these uh, Dehn twists in this particular way. And then you can go ahead. So these are complete concrete matrices, matrices on these uh, multiplier spaces or the multiplicity spaces of the action that we computed before. And you can work them out and then compute, of course, for instance, such uh, long chains of products of S and T's. And uh, uh, of course, the uh, enthusiasts about this will know that, I mean, with this thing, you can compute, uh, for instance, uh, the uh, topological invariance of lens spaces, because lens spaces uh, admit a Hegart decomposition, genus 1 Hegar decomposition, so you can build lens spaces um, by taking uh, uh, two solid tori and gluing them after applying a m a modular transformation to, to one of the torus. And so indeed one can check when one evaluates that in the representation I've just constructed in front of your eyes, when you can evaluate this, uh, this in this representation so matrix elements of this particular form in some particular states, that you cover exactly the formula that, uh, uh, for this Alexander Conway invariant that uh, Rosansky and Salur computed uh, uh, in, in 92. All right, good. So that brings me to the end. I think I'm uh, finished in time. So let me just uh, summarize. So I think the main, uh, main uh, point of this talk was to, to show to you that uh, there is actually a framework to quantize supergroup Chern Simons theory, which is. Uh, it's very universal and with a little bit of, of twists and um, in particular realizing this representation of multiplicity spaces, it stands well to actually do to real computations here. So the GL11 case is essentially finished. That's the work we're pre finishing now with uh, Azad and uh, Nejla and Mikal. But there's other interesting examples that should also be relatively easy to compute uh, explicitly because they have a sort of low rank. I mean, there's basically Poussonic algebra is, is only rank one. So, um, so I think that's uh, sort of my, my main message. It was sort of a, a modest message um, to convey, but I still think there is, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, a lot of interesting uh, uh, things to, to extract, in particular as one goes to these more interesting uh, super algebras, SL12 and uh, PSL22, which I think uh, in this case, these invariants are not, not known. Um, in fact, yeah, maybe I, in view of time, I, I leave this if, if there's questions on that. What kind of excites me, um, most of it, and you've probably seen that before, is that these algebras of observables are really, really interesting algebras um, that appear in many other places in theoretical physics and studying their representation theory uh, can teach us a lot. As I said, there's a deep connection with uh, Godon and Hitchin integrable systems, more generally super integrable systems, and you can realize many interesting quantum mechanics integrable systems uh, in, this, in this framework. Um, and uh, so maybe with this comment, uh, so which is then of course also related to some of the things I'm currently thinking about. With these comments, let me, let me just stop. And uh, if you want to hear more about this, I'm happy to talk about this uh, after or in questions.
Let me just say happy birthday, Hubert. Yeah, that of course fits with uh, uh, Jean Bernard's uh, Chinese quote. In the end, this is in Chinatown in, in Los Angeles, where we met, I think, probably seven years ago. Hmm? Okay, thanks a lot, Volker. Is it? No, no, this is. Uh, in, did we meet in Tokyo? Do you have a yeah. question? <laughs> where we met. In so if you go from GL11 yeah. to GLNN, yes. do you get more sophisticated invariants? Is what happened. Oh, oh yeah, but it will be much harder to yes. to evaluate. So I think one thing I so I think there is a qualitative new difference when when you go from here, I mean from here to here. I think this is yeah. all fairly simple. What happens is at some point, so the example I showed you and the examples this one will have basically this A02, so the two puncture disk, without handles will be still a commutative algebra. Something will happen when you go, for instance, for GLN, this will become a non-commutative algebra. That's already an interesting object to study. Um, but in terms of invariants, what do you expect? That, that they'll be manifold, that can't be distinguished by GL11 and can be distinguished by GLNN? It oh, I mean, you're more an expert in topological invariants uh, th than, than I am. Uh, okay. So I, I honestly, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the topological invariants is a nice application, but it's not sort of the the thing that drives me to study this uh, most of all. Another question. You, you never have yeah. to take a continuum limit. I mean, no, because it's topological. It's topolo so the theory is topological no. and... Uh, so yeah. Okay. I mean, we've tried something similar. Maybe that's I can add. I mean, again, this is a long time ago. We tried in a similar way to, to think of... Uh, of Vesumino models as yes. kind of a, a lattice ver I mean, this as being like a lattice discretization of, uh, of Vesumino models. And then you would have to take some the kind of uh, okay. continuum okay. limit. But then the issue is a little bit, I mean, which Hamiltonian you choose. Um, so I think, um, I think uh, yeah, this never really materialized, except that you get the representation category always right, more or less by construction. I, I don't think uh, we got really the state spaces ever. Okay. Ever right. So there, there would be interesting applications, I think, of this. But uh, anyway, I'm glad this this paper we wrote with Lev was dead for 20 years, and now it's uh, it's back alive. Huh? More questions or comments? So if not, uh, let's uh, thank Volker again. Thank you.